message of the Bible. Let's, let's talk about for a few minutes this morning the connective tissue that holds the stories, the lessons of scripture together in a cohesive message. Uh, what is it that seems to be the predominant recurring theme as we read the Bible as one book, the entirety of the Bible, uh, as the inspired, authoritative, God-breathed living word, and not merely as a scattered collection of disjointed and chronologically sometimes confusing stories. And a hint, it's not about us. So, okay, wait a minute, Phil, what do you mean it's not about us? Who is it about then? I mean, aren't we the target of Scripture's lessons? Isn't so much of the Old and the New Testament about the theme of redemption? Aren't we center to this story? Isn't God's word about his love for us, his forgiveness for us, his desire for a restored relationship with us? Isn't the Bible about people, about God's people? Are we not the focus of Scripture? After all, 2 Chronicles 7, 14, and many other examples. If my people who are called by name will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then I will hear from heaven and I will forgive their sin and will heal their land. It's about the people, right? So there's an Old Testament example of people and redemption as a recurring and important theme in Scripture. And, and what about a New Testament example? There are many. 1 John 1, 9, just one of many we could think of. If we confess our sins. He is faithful and just and will forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. That's a whole lot of we, us, and our, isn't it? And it's easy to see that repeated and recurring throughout scripture. So yes, it's absolutely true. The words we, us, our, our role in this story, it's a major thread in the story of scripture. Our sin condition, our need for redemption, our need for community, our place in the story, in, in the history, in the poetry, in the wisdom literature, in the response to prophecy or the rejection of prophecy, in the gospels, in the epistles, the letters and instructions of encouragement, and in the eschatology or the conclusion, the climax of the story. Yes, we can find that we are indeed in a major part of that thread and we are in that story. It's woven throughout scripture. It's true, and it's intentional. And to emphasize this for just a moment, I'd like you to do something with me. I'm going to put 10 seconds on the clock, and I'd like actually for you to participate and count out loud with me 10, 10 seconds. Let's count slowly from 1 to 10, okay? 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10. Not a scientific seconds, but approximately 10 seconds just went, just went by. And in those 10 seconds, a phenomenal number of things happened in the world. And in those 10 seconds, 30 people just passed into eternity. Statistically, every 10 seconds, about 30 people. Three people per second. Well, of those 30 people that just passed into eternity in that 10 second span of time, one is an animist, or a tribal person who's living in fear of countless evil spirits. Three of them are Buddhist, mainly in the enormous country of China. Five are Hindu, worshiping over 30 million false gods. Seven of them are Muslim, worshiping Allah, instead of the God who sacrificed his son to save us. Seven are atheists, or agnostics, with belief either in no God, no belief in any God, or a complacent attitude about the possibility of God's existence. Well, the remaining seven are Christian, and of those seven, four are Roman Catholic, and three are, are Protestant. And we, all we have to do is compare simple math with the word of God that we can read plainly, and we get a very clear picture of what the need of the world is, how much there still is to do in terms of our responsibility as the church in fulfilling the Great Commission. And absolutely, that is clearly a major, major theme in scripture. Well, we're living in a world that is nearing eight billion people. Eight billion. Does anybody remember when we topped seven billion? It was about a decade ago, 20, 2012 is, is when statistically that, that happened. Um, let's go back a few more decades. When, when I was born, uh, the population was only half of what it is right now. 
or less than half, 3.5 billion people approximately. And then the very next day, it was 3.5 billion and two because Lori is one day younger than me and she's a twin. <laughs> but today it's almost eight billion people. And well, how do you even get your mind wrapped around the concept of one billion, let alone eight billion? So just think about the number one billion for a moment. Let's think about it in terms of time. You can, we're talking about it in terms of population. What about, what about in terms of time? A billion hours ago. Anybody have any clue what was happening about a billion hours ago? Well, one billion hours ago, the Earth was still without form and void. That, that's hard to wrap my mind around. How about a billion minutes ago? Approximately a billion minutes ago, Christ was walking the Earth. A billion seconds ago, give or take, the Hubble Space Telescope was launched. The Balkan states declared independence from the Soviet Union. Germany was reunited, and Lori and I got married. About a billion seconds ago was the very end of the 80s and the early, uh, early days of the 90s. But a billion is a really hard number to comprehend. Even harder to imagine that God could care profoundly about each one as an individual with unique compassion for each individual. So almost eight billion people are on Earth, about a third of them, several billion still, two, two and a half, almost three billion people, still have never heard the gospel of Christ presented to them. Many of them don't even have a copy of the scripture, Old or New Testament, translated into their own language. Of the world's 6,528 cataloged languages, approximately 3,000 don't have any part of the word of God available in their language. As, as Dan mentioned uh, a few moments ago, and a lot of you know, uh, partly because it's right down the street, our office is uh, about 1.1 mile away, I think, from, from the church. Uh, we work for an organization, a, a global ministry organization called Avant Ministries, with approximately 500 uh, workers in about 50 countries on five continents. Um, and we've been with Avant for 30 years this summer. We just passed an anniversary last month. And one of the things that we do is we partner with uh, a lot of other ministry organizations that are equally focused on reaching the unreached. And there's a, there's a new alliance, it's about three years old, called the Alliance for the Unreached. Our, and our goal in this alliance is to bring awareness to the fact that about a third of the population of this planet has never or seldom heard the gospel and then together to find innovative ways to send and to go and to reach them with the gospel. And all of this flows from our clear understanding of the thread of redemption and calling and missional purpose that we read about in scripture. So absolutely, this is a, a core theme in scripture. But as big as those numbers are, about eight billion people, a third of them who haven't heard uh, and, and as hard as it is to wrap our minds around that kind of number, the world is also a small place. It's, it's an in, incomprehensively large number of people and simultaneously a small place and getting smaller all the time, even with nearly 8 billion of us walking around, divided among about 11,000 different ethnic groups. Massive changes that we've experienced in our lifetime in technology, in communication, in transportation. Led, has, it's led to a phenomenon that we now know and understand, a, a word that became part of our vocabulary in most of our lifetimes, and it's now a very familiar concept to all of us, and that's globalization. And, and one of the now very well-documented, very famous examples, like a classic example of globalization, is the death of Princess Diana that happened in 1997. Listen to this just crazy picture of globalization and the world's groups and, and cultures. So you've got an English princess with an Egyptian pro, uh, boyfriend crashed in a French tunnel driving a German car with a Dutch engine driven by a Belgian who was drunk on Scotch whiskey, <laughs> followed closely by Italian paparazzi on Japanese motorcycles, treated by an American doctor using Brazilian medicine. And I got all that information on a computer that uses chips from Taiwan, a Korean monitor assembled by Bangladeshi workers in a Singapore plant shipped via Indonesia with tech support provided by India. Okay, a, a crazy and extreme, almost comical example, right? But you get the picture. 
Truly, the lines are blurring. The nations are converging in more and more places and in, in more and more ways. Another way to think about this large number, this concept of the billions, is that, think about this, there are more people alive today on Earth than the sum total of all people who lived and died on Earth from the Garden of Eden until Y2K, the year 2000. Another mind-boggling thing. And yet it's still a small world, not only because of the realities and the dramatic changes of globalization, how that's changing the game for us daily, but because God is deeply concerned individually for each person among all those billions of people. God wants them to experience true family. You might say that God is really into international adoptions. Uh, he desires to adopt the peoples of the earth as his sons and his daughters, and then to host the most incredible family reunion. If only the nations knew if only they had the opportunity to know what God desires for them. If only they had a, a clear sense of what God means and what he desires when we talk about family, uh, the family of God, and being adopted as his sons and daughters. Let the nations be glad. God has in store for them something incredible. He has in store for them what he announced at Christ's birth to the shepherds. The angels procla proclaimed Christ's arrival as the good news of exceeding great joy, right? God has a desire and a plan for the nations. And to put God's ultimate plan into a different perspective, maybe to try to, try to uh, begin to understand God's missionary heart and to understand an even clearer picture, perhaps, of, of, of what really unifies an otherwise, sometimes the way we read it, an otherwise disparate collection of, of stories and chronologies in the Bible. Let's, let's look at this in light of a brief synopsis of man's history and future from, from Genesis to Revelation. What are the connecting threads from, from beginning to end, from Alpha to Omega, from Genesis to Revelation? And so I'm going to put a timeline uh, from Genesis to Revelation. And you thought our scripture passage this morning was Psalm 96, right? But truthfully, our theme is, and I hear Yoda's voice in my mind, everything. Our theme this morning, our scripture passage, is the Bible. It's all of scripture. Genesis to Revelation, all of them, all, 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 all of scripture. So hold on to your hat. I don't see any hats anyway, so don't hold on to this. Um, we're going to cover all of history and the future in approximately three minutes. We're going to basically go back uh, about a billion hours. And we're going to go forward about a billion hours. So let's, let's start in the beginning. We know how the story starts. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. The earth was without form. Okay, we'll skip the majority of Genesis chapter 1. If we're going to read all of this passage today, we'd be here a long, long time. So we'll jump down to verse 27, and that's where it says that God created man in his own image. So now we have people that are in the story. This is when the story begins to, to be really interesting. And the story goes more or less like this. There was fellowship between God and man in the Garden of Eden, but sin damaged that relationship. Following the original sin, things went from bad to worse. There was a human degeneration to such a state that God punished man by flooding the earth. And then again, in the wickedness of man following the flood, man wanted the glory for themselves that was due only God. We're moving right along here. We're in chapter 11 now of Genesis, but we're still in the book of Genesis in the beginning. Well, what happened at the Tower of Babel then? We read that God scattered the people. He scrambled the languages. People previously were one people speaking one language. There was only one ethnic group. And after the Tower of Babel, humanity was divided into people groups. Then called Abraham, Genesis chapter 12, verses 1 through 3, and biblical missions was born. God promised he would pour out his blessing on Abraham to be a blessing for all the people groups. And this promise to Abraham is then fulfilled in Jesus Christ, Galatians 3, 8. God's purpose for all the peoples of the earth was continually announced in scriptures. God did not set Israel apart merely for their own sake and their benefit. They were the chosen ones through whom the Messiah for all peoples would come. 
Psalm 67, a reminder of God's purpose and plan that Jesus clearly articulated in the Great Commission. And Psalm 96, 3 that we read this morning, declare his glory among the nations. It's the commission that's, that's reaffirmed in Matthew 28 and throughout the Gospels. Go and make disciples of all, all nations, all peoples. In the book of Acts, we see God's plan to build and utilize the church to carry his message to the ends of the earth. And in Paul's letters, we have practical and corrective lessons for the church that are involved in that global journey. That's for us. Now let's fast forward to the book of Revelation. In Revelation chapters 5 through 7, we read that when John looked in his vision at the conclusion of God's saving activity, he saw the purpose of God finally fulfilled. God's salvation reached people from every tribe and language and people and nation. And then the ultimate climactic ending is, is spelled out for us. The revelation of Jesus Christ, the unveiling of our exalted, glorified, and sovereign Lord over his church, over the world. It's, it's, he's revealed, the, the executor of the decrees of God in order to consummate his victory over the world and establish the royal kingdom of God. And then we read in that culminating chapter, that culminating book, worthy are, are you, O Lord and God, to receive glory and honor and power, for you created all things, and by your will they existed and were created, and we sang portions of that even this morning in our worship. So there is a synopsis in about 180 seconds, a synopsis of man's history and future, and we see the unifying theme of scripture, God's glory, that, that covers the entire Bible. It's woven throughout the, all of scripture. So what's, what's the point? Well, part of the point is that God's plan is still unfolding. This, it's happening right now. And we, the church, are the current players on center stage to carry that plan out. Now, it, we know, and we're reading in Zechariah and other, and other places, even in these weeks and months, with, with, our, with our focus on the minor prophets, it's been the role of different mess messengers throughout history uh, and different stages of time in, in the Old Testament to carry out God's plan and, and to carry his message. But right now, we're it. It's the role of the church. It's the responsibility of our family. We must share the gospel with the nations. It's what we're designed, compelled, um, empowered, and, and expected to do. So bringing all that down to where we started this. Obviously, God's creation, humanity, people, and the needs of people uh, globally for redemption, it's a major, major theme in scripture, no denying that. The question is, is our storyline, our need, our relationships, our redemption, are, are we the central, most important reason for scripture's existence and the primary unifying message or theme of the Bible? It, it really is natural for us as finite humans to interpret uh, what we read throughout the Bible, to interpret this cohesive story as though we are the central character. And, and I'll be honest, I, I'm a missionary uh, and a mission agency leader. I'm a, I'm a practitioner of the strategic components or the strategic aspects of, of the Great Commission, of Great Commission fulfillment. And because our work is with the cultures of the world, the peoples of the world, and trying to understand their need and their separation from God and being agents to correct that issue by, by declaring the truth of, of God's word, it's, it's easy, it's natural for us to focus primarily and sometimes exclusively on our horizontal relationships, on our relationships with, with people, with other humans, or, or to focus on our analysis of methodologies and strategies for things like church planting, uh, or the measurable outcomes that we need to prepare and report to our board of directors. And all of that stuff is important. It's, it's good stuff. Very much a part of the going and making disciples that we're, we're commanded to do, and very much woven through scripture as well. So it's certainly not wrong for us to examine how we fit in the story to assess and personalize what it means for us, how we order and how we conduct our lives. But it's also easy to lose sight of God's glory. Uh, that's our vertical relationship, 
our horizontal relationship is, is with, the, with each other, with, with humanity, within the church and, and within all of our relationships. But we lose sight of where to aim the compass of our lives or where to focus our energy in our ministry and in our decision making. If our lives are not centered in God's glory and in that vertical relationship, who then is steering our ship? Who's influencing our decision making? And if we only think of scripture in in this way, in seeing ourselves as the central character, looking in scripture for simply what is in God's word for us, we're missing a critical dimension, a depth, a completeness to God's word. Even the primary reason for God's word, the purpose of God's word, which is his glory revealed to us. So our reading this morning uh, during our our worship time was, was Psalm 96. Every verse, every word in this psalm is rich and powerful and useful. Phrases such as, ascribe to the Lord the glory due his name. But probably verse 3, Psalm 96, 3, is a particularly memorable verse, almost a, a billboard or bumper sticker type, type of verse, the, a kind of summary of God's purpose for Scripture and his purpose for the world. Declare his glory among the nations, his marvelous deeds among all the peoples. You won't, you won't find an outline in your message notes this morning, uh, but you've got a large open space there to capture comments. If there's one thing I would say might be, would highlight that might be worthy of writing down uh, this morning in your notes, it's perhaps the answer to this question that's implied in, in the message title this morning, the unifying message of the Bible. And hint, it's, it's not about us. So what is it about? It's about God's glory. Highlighted by that first phrase in Psalm 96.3, Declare his glory among the nations. So, so we, us, our, yes, we and God are woven throughout the entire story together. But, but don't miss this. It is God's glory, not us, that is the unifying, central, purposeful message of Scripture. Declare, each of these phrases has an important aspect in, in, our, in our understanding. Declare, that's, our, that's a summarized in a single word, our commission, our great commission. His glory, that's God's purpose and motivation, the unifying theme of, of scripture. And what's the scope of that declaration of his glory? Among the nations, the people that God created for his glory and whom he loves unconditionally. There, there's almost, uh, there's most certainly a strong connection between God's glory and and the redemption of God's people. But as we examine scripture comprehensively, it's abundantly clear that the central character, as as much as we are present in that story, the central character is not us. It's clear that the central theme, the purpose, the central character of scripture, his motivation is, is God and his glory. There's probably no biblical theme that is grander or more comprehensively described than the glory of God. The entire biblical storyline, it's the story and celebration of God's glory. In the beginning, God crowned his image image bearers. His his creation, the, the fall, in the cross, in the age to come, we see this. In his creation, with glory and honor, he crowned his image bearers. In the fall, we exchanged God's glory for idols. In the cross, there's reconciliation where Jesus unites his people to himself, the Lord of glory. And in the age to come, in eternity, a billion hours from now and a billion hours after that, God's people will walk in the freedom of the glory of God as his family forever. God's glory has the spotlight in every major aspect of the Bible, in every book of the Bible, in every section and story that we read, God's glory is present. His glory affects every major biblical doctrine. It's interwoven throughout all of scripture. It forms the origin, the context, and the ultimate goal of the story. God's glory, the unifying theme of scripture. His his glory is revealed through creation, Genesis, Psalms, Romans, 
It's identified with humanity created in the image of God and crowned with glory in Genesis, Psalms, and 1 Corinthians. God's glory is linked to the Exodus. It's characterized as fire, as a shining light, or as a bright light in places like Exodus, Leviticus, Isaiah, Ezekiel, Luke, 2 Corinthians, Hebrews, and Revelation. God's glory takes the form of a cloud. Exodus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, 1 Kings, 2 Chronicles, Luke, Acts. God's glory is identified with the Sabbath. God's glory is revealed to Moses. God's glory fills the tabernacle. Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers. God's glory fills the earth in the Psalms, in Isaiah. God's glory fills the temple in 1 Kings. God's glory is above the heavens in the Psalms. God's glory is revealed in visions to Isaiah and to Ezekiel. God's glory is identified with God's people, Israel. God's glory is identified with Christ and linked to his incarnation. We read that in John, in Mark, in, in Hebrews. God's glory is present in the birth of Christ in Luke and throughout the Gospels. It's present in miracles in John and elsewhere. It's present in the transfiguration in all of the Gospels and in 2 Peter. God's glory is present in Christ's suffering and in his crucifixion, in his resurrection, in his exaltation, in Acts, Romans, Philemon, Hebrews, 1 Peter, 1 Timothy, Revelation. God's glory is present in his ascension in Acts and 1 Timothy. God's glory is present and identified with the church. And God's glory is manifested in the new creation. And we see it talked about in Isaiah, described in Romans, and culminated in the book of Revelation. And, and as we wrap up, let, let these passages of Scripture uh, about God's glory speak for themselves as they highlight the unifying tapestry of the story of Scripture. And we could do this all day because these passages are everywhere in Scripture. I want to highlight a few from the Old and New Testament and some of what they say to us. God created us for his glory. Bring my sons from afar and my daughters from the end of the earth, everyone who is called by my name, whom I created for my glory, Isaiah 43. God called Israel for his glory. You are my servant, Israel, in whom I will be glorified, also in Isaiah 49. God's plan is to fill the earth with the knowledge of his glory. And, and this one from one of the minor prophets that we recently studied. For the earth will be filled with the knowledge of the glory of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. Jesus told us to do good works so that God gets glory. In the same way, let your light shine before others so that they may see your good works and give glory to your Father who is in heaven. In Matthew and, and 1 Peter. Jesus warned that not seeking God's glory makes faith impossible. How can you believe when you receive glory from one another and do not seek the glory that comes from the only God? Jesus said that he answers prayer that God would be glorified. Whatever you ask in my name, from John 14, this I will do that the Father may be glorified in the Son. And Jesus receives us into his fellowship for the glory of God. Welcome one another as Christ has welcomed you for the glory of God. We, we read in Romans 15. God instructs us to do everything for his glory. So whether you eat or drink or whatever you do, do all for the glory of God in, in 1 Corinthians chapter 10. All are under judgment for dishonoring God's glory. For all have sinned and all fall short of the glory of God. Some of these verses read differently that we know so well, but when the emphasis is on the glory of the God, on the glory of God, and, and not on us as the central character, right? Jesus' ultimate aim for us is that we see and enjoy his glory. Father, I desire that they also, whom you have given me, may be with me where I am to see my glory that you have given me because you loved me before the foundation of the world. John 17. And in the new Jerusalem, the glory of God replaces the sun in the culmination of this story. And the city has no need of sun or moon. We're just saying indescribable, talking about God placing the sun and the stars and the moon. 
Uh, there's not going to be any need of that because of the glory of God that shines. No need of sun or moon to shine on it, for the glory of God gives its light, and its lamp is the Lamb. So, so we've talked about the natural tendency that we have to see ourselves as the central character throughout Scripture. And, and indeed, we are very much a part of that recurring thread that ties it all together. But we've seen God's glory as the true unifying theme of Scripture. Let, let me encourage you to emphasize both the horizontal and the vertical relationship and, and how you interpret God's word. Emphasize both yet not lose sight of first fixing our compass on the glory of God. That's our starting point, the single most important unifying purpose of God's living word. And let's pray together. Lord, we thank you for your indescribable majesty. We sang words to that effect in the worship uh, before, before our message and before our scripture reading. We thank you that your glory is so all-encompassing, so perfect, so bright, so eternal, that it's going to even replace the need to have a sun and a moon as we see and understand them today for our, for our light here on earth. And while we know that we, as your creation, as people with a task to do as the church to meet the needs of the people in this world is an important thread in scripture, may we fix our gaze, our focus, and, and, and set our compass uh, based on your glory and see you as the central theme, purpose, revealer in scripture. And may we ascribe to you the glory that's due your name and not try to take that glory or, or see ourselves as the important part of the story. We're grateful, Lord, for the fact that you are an adopter into your family of sons and daughters, that we get to be called your children, and therefore the truth is that we will spend eternity with you, and we will bask in your, your glory. We will get to see and experience that glory in a way that is eternal and perhaps different than what we experience now. We thank you for the glimpses that we have, the opportunity that we have through worship and through the truth of your word to see that glory but we look forward to the day when we really will experience it in all of its fullness together. And we thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. We're going to close with uh, another hymn so the worship team can make their way back up. But, but let me first say a, a word about the hymn that we sang earlier. Uh, I love to tell the story. And I always appreciate when Dan provides some, some context and some backstory for the hymns that we, we sing uh, because the history of these hymns is so rich. Some of, the, some of the stories that we sing about and how we got so many of the hymns that we sing are really, really remarkable. Our, our family, as a lot of you know, uh, has, a, has a strong musical background, and we share a deep appreciation for hymnology, the source and the meaning behind our hymns. The lyrics that we sang, I love to tell the story of unseen things above, of Jesus and his glory, of Jesus and his love. Just in that opening stanza, we have a focus on what the story is about, and it's about God's glory. And the hymn is also about declaring his glory, telling that story to the nations. A fascinating thing is that that hymn was originally part of a 50 stanza poem. Can you imagine singing that 50 stanzas long? It was called The Old, Old Story, and it was written by Catherine Hankey in 1866. And then a year later, the story was read, that poem was, was read at a large YMCA, YMCA gathering in Montreal, Canada, and, and Dr. W.H. Doan heard the poem. He put the words to music. A little interesting and personal side note is that Doan is the person that the music building is named for at Moody Bible Institute, where Lori and I met each other, where we spent a lot of time, where, where, where Lori especially spent many hours in that building as a music major. And Doan is the composer of more than 2,000 hymns. So just a fascinating backstory to that story, to that, that hymn that we sang as well. Very often a theme song uh, over decades at, at missions conferences. The hymn that we're going to close with, Take My Life and Let It Be, is a hymn of commitment. It's a hymn of consecration. It was written by Francis Havergal. Uh, a few years after the, the other hymn that we sang, 1874. Uh, Havergal was an English poet, 
She was known for another hymn, uh, Like a River Glorious, that I'm sure many of us know and have sung as well. She was originally just a poet. She was focused on writing, not so much in the, on the hymns side of things. And, but friends noticed that she had a beautiful singing voice. She studied, she ultimately became an in-demand concert soloist. She wasn't just a good singer, she was deemed to be a great singer. She was also a brilliant pianist. She learned Greek and Hebrew, had a passion for studying scripture effectively, and that had a great effect on her poetry and ultimately on her hymn writing. And this hymn, Take My Life and Let It Be, directs our attention toward worship of God for his glory. Take my life and let it be consecrated, Lord, to thee, ascribing to you the glory that's due your name. Take my moments and my days and let them flow in endless praise, directing our praise to his glory and, and not to ourselves. So let's sing this together. <laughs> 